Hey, Walter Sorrell's back with another Pops Project of the Month. Today, making a mini hatchet. Today on our Pops Project of the Month, we're making a mini hatchet, camp hatchet, pack hatchet. Well, call it whatever you want, but we're making it. Actually, four of them. One or four, depends on how you look at it. What I mean is, we're making four hatchets, but all to the exact same plan. Why so many? Let's find out. Now, this is basically a nice, simple project, but there's a lot to learn. In fact, the big focus today will be on this simple thing right here. Yeah, it's a drill. See, there's a deceptively simple but fundamental skill that every knife maker needs, and I'm just talking about drilling holes. So we're gonna slice and dice that skill today. All right, let's get on it. One of the cool things about this build is that I'm not using a lot of different materials. Mainly, this is just about using a big old four inch wide piece of 8670 steel. It started 48 inches long, so that was my main design constraint for the hatchet. Couldn't be wider than four inches or thicker than a quarter inch. You know, I used to design blades on paper, but I've gotten so used to designing using CAD software that it's as natural to me as drawing. So in this case, I came up with the basic plan in Fusion 360, which is the CAD program that I use, then printed it out in a couple pieces so I could tape it together and use it as a design template. The hatchet was actually too big to fit on one piece of paper. Now, as you can see, a big feature here is this line of circles. Those are holes, and those holes need to be pretty precisely laid out, or the whole thing's going to just look awful. Now, it might seem a little nerdy or fussy or whatever, but I'm going to spend a bunch of time talking about how to lay out and drill holes in a precise way in this video. Now, I'll start with a really simple approach. In this case, I just cut out this pattern, which you can get off of my Patreon site. Check the description for that. And I taped it onto the steel and then started marking the holes. Like I said, you want to be as careful with this as you can. I'll show you a bunch of ways of laying out those holes, but here I'm basically just finding the little bullseye in the center of each hole and using a prick punch, which is a super sharp little punch, to carefully hammer a tiny little mark. Now I've already covered the steel in layout fluid, so I'll go ahead and mark the outline of the hatchet. Then, off comes the template, and I'll use a heavier punch to expand the tiny little divots that I laid in with that prick punch. You can use a spring punch. Or a standard punch. Either one's fine, though the hammer type punch leaves a bigger cavity, so sometimes I'll actually use all three. Now it's over to the drill press. The way that I do this here is I bring the drill down until it's centered in the punch mark. You should actually feel it seating itself as the point of the drill goes down into that little divot. If you can't feel it, you're not in the right place. Then turn on the drill with extremely light pressure. It's going to vibrate, and as it vibrates, it's going to find its center. While the drill tip is sort of holding it in place, now I'll secure the blade with the vice grip clamp so the bit doesn't grab hold and helicopter the blade. Then, after all of that rigmarole, I'll drill away using an eighth inch drill. Takes a while to explain it, but pretty simple to do. You can really beat a large drill to death by drilling in hard materials because the center part of the drill is under a bunch of pressure. If you pre-drill a smaller hole, your larger drill will last way longer. So I'll drill all the punch marks in the same fashion. Then I'll swap in the 3 8 inch drill, which is our final diameter for these holes, and repeat more or less the same process. Seat the drill, turn it on so it kind of jitters that blade into a stable centered position, set the clamp, then drill all the way through. This drill has precious little torque, so it'll tend to get stuck when it breaks through with large drills like this, as you can see here. So I kind of pump the handle a little at the end, and that helps it break through without getting stuck. And there we are. 
Today's video is of course sponsored by Pops Knife Supplies, your source for everything in the world of knife making. Now, Pops just moved to a new location in Gainesville, Georgia. It's right here near Atlanta. If you haven't been there, you're missing a big treat. There's more retail space, more room for steel, more room for micarta, more room for belts and abrasives, more room for cool tools for knife making. What if you're not a knife maker? Well, they also have room for more knives. If you love knives, Pop should be a destination for you no matter what. And obviously, they'll continue to expand their already huge online inventory of blade making gear and supplies. Pop's knife dot supplies. Okay, now a super simple method, probably the simplest method of drilling accurately placed holes. In this case, I'm using a drilling vise instead of those vise grip clamps. I've got one corner loosely anchored to the table, again to avoid helicoptering. Otherwise, very similar procedure to the other clamp. The only drawback is dependent on having a drilling guide, that is, pre-drilled holes in another piece of metal. But here I've got the benefit of having just made one. So I'll just use the first copy that I made of this hatchet as a guide and then drill straight on through the previous holes. If you're doing a bunch of copies of one knife, or in this case a hatchet, you can really save enormous amounts of time by using a drilling guide. Key point though, you're well advised to use locator pins to accurately maintain all the distances. Otherwise things can shift around and then they get out of whack. If you think concentrating on all this detail about drilling is silly, I want to convince you otherwise. First, it's just kind of interesting that something we all probably take for granted has so many facets and complexities and that's cool, but more importantly, drilling is a really critical skill for knife makers. The approach that works for one situation is often not so good for another situation, so sometimes when you switch styles of knife making, you'll start running into a situation where the kind of holes that you drilled before maybe don't work so great. So that's why it's good to see a bunch of approaches, even if a couple of them aren't relevant to you right now. While I'm at it, worth addressing is the question of why all the holes in this design. Simple. Weight. The idea here is to make something you can throw in your pack without adding a ton of weight. Alright, technique three. By the way, I'm not trying to show every drilling technique in the world, just some that I like to use. This is actually my preferred method, at least for a project like this, where I'm not making a ton of knives at a time. But it's gear dependent as you'll see. I'll be using the DRO, that's the digital readout, on my mill drill to gain accuracy in the thousandths of an inch range. Obviously got to have a mill for doing it this way. But here's what I do. Using the measurements from the plans I made on my CAD program, I'll just dial everything in and run the holes at each location. I'm using a different technique from the one that I did before, spotting the holes rather than drilling them initially. A spotting drill is a drill specifically made for producing a small, precisely located divot, which can then be expanded with a second drill. So in this case, I want to avoid all the punch stuff and just go straight to drilling. Spot drill, spot drill, spot drill. Then I basically reverse directions using all those same measurements, but working my way back with the 3 8 inch drill. Now I could do the 1 8 inch drill trick, but this drill has more torque and can be run slower than my little drill press that I was using before, so I'm happy just going straight to the main diameter. All right, last approach, not relevant to hardly any of you. Okay, clamp hatchet number four in the CNC machine and hit the green button. Come back in a minute and it's done. Now, why am I showing you this since most of you are never gonna be using a CNC machine? The point here is that I'm actually not drilling these holes at all in this case. I start by drilling a pilot hole, then I use an end mill to bore out the rest of the hole. The reason I bring this up at all is that you can buy boring heads to attach to manual mills and even to drill presses, 
And if you really, really need an accurately dimensioned hole, boring is a great way to do it. Now we've got holes. Let's do the hatchety part. First, gotta eliminate all this material. The big rule among metal workers is never mill or grind anything that you can saw. So, over to the abrasive chop saw. Boom. Unfortunately, the long edge won't fit in the chop saw or in my band saw, so I'll go ahead and chop out the rest with an angle grinder. If you have a plasma cutter, that's a cool tool too. And by the way, if you're doing this at home and all you got is simple tools, you can absolutely do this entire thing with a hacksaw. A lot of people don't know this, but you can actually turn the hacksaw blade 90 degrees, get the handle part out of the way, and you can make really, really long saw cuts. Now it's over to the belt grinder. This is not complicated, but it's slow because you have a fair amount of material to remove. I'm using a 36 grit Norton Blaze ceramic belt from Pops. Very durable, excellent cutting belts. And there we go, starting to look like a hatchet. Next, we're going to be using a material that's one of Pop's specialties, and that's vintage micarta, burgundy with little gold threads. As micarta ages, it changes color near the edges of the material, giving it some visual interest and complexity that fresh micarta straight out of the factory just doesn't have. Clamp it in here and drill holes to mate with the holes in the hatchet. Just like we did before, locator pins are crucial here. Now a couple of 1 8 inch holes for pins that will actually hold it on. And we're good to go. Next, I'll mark the grind lines for the business end of the hatchet using calipers and a height gauge on the machinist's surface plate. Now, I've showed center scribes made for this exact purpose in about a million videos, but this is just another way of doing it. Check one of my other videos if you want to see that. Now, back to the grinder. And I'll grind the bevels in freehand. This is something you can obviously do with a grinding jig, too. But as bevel grinding goes, this is about as simple as it gets. We're just roughing it out. We're not trying to make it perfect right now. Now we're ready to heat treat. 8670 is pretty forgiving to heat treat, so you can do this in a heat treating oven or a forge and get excellent results. I'm quenching into a fast industrial quenching oil called Parks 50, heating to 1500, holding for 10 minutes, then quenching. Next, I'll temper for two cycles of two hours at 450 degrees Fahrenheit, which should give a good combination of edge holding and shock resistance. I haven't talked too much about 8670, but it's an excellent steel for the beginner knife maker. Kind of a pet steel it pops. It's pretty easy and forgiving. It's good for forging. And it's got high toughness and decent hardness, which is exactly the kind of steel that you want to use for hatchets, camp knives, and other tools that need to have the ability to withstand impact. In this case, I'm actually going to make one of them with handle scales, and then the rest of them will be skeleton types. So the one with the scales is going to have to be pinned and epoxied in place.
Now it's back to the grinder to clean them up. After getting the basic lines right and the corners all broken, I'll move to a slack belt setup. I'm still on 36 grit ceramic belts. Then once things get rounded off, I'll move up to higher grit belts. At this point I like using J-weight belts, the real flexible soft belts. Now it's back to the grinder to clean up the cutting edges. I'll work my way up to 150 micron Trizac belts. Again, you can get these from Pops. I love them for finishing. Now I'll finish up my hatchet. And there we go. A great tool for light chopping when weight's a premium. If you've ever prepared kindling at a campsite with a camp knife, you know that camp knives are nice and all, but the truth is they aren't the greatest for chopping. A little hatchet like this splits the difference between a knife and a full-sized axe, and you can really go after it with one of these. By the way, if you'd like to pick up one of these bad boys, the ones that were actually made for this video, I'll have them on my website at tacticsarmory.com. They're nice keepsakes. I'm going to laser etch on there as one-of-a-kind items made specifically for this video. Now, these video blades tend to go pretty quick, so if you want one, probably want to grab it fast. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's video. As we've seen, if you're interested in knife making, there's just no reason for you not to jump in. Hey, make it a New Year's resolution. We made a passel of hatchets today, all of them with pretty much the same level of quality, but just with a completely wide range of tools. So no matter what people on YouTube might make you think, and I'm as guilty of that as the next guy, let's face it, you don't need a ton of expensive gear to get started. You can shoot a small order to Pops, maybe pick up a drill press and a cheap grinder somewhere if you don't already have one, and bam, you're a knife maker. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and see you soon. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years, so I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. WalterSorrelsBlades.com